Thanks, Gary, uh, and thanks, Marcello, and everybody for finally putting this together. Uh, he asked me to come last year, but that was the big spring show at CalArts, which we will talk about, and you'll see some of the results of that. Um, so, as Gary said, I sort of, uh, I sort of live around now and do a lot of work at CalArts, Arizona State, uh, advise a couple projects at Stanford, and um, pretty much I work for my students. If you look at all the slides as we go along, I've always told my students my whole academic career, you have to take care of me when I get old, and so uh, they, they do. So pretty much every check I get today comes from uh, one of my students, which is good. So teachers, be careful. Um, my motivation comes from a really good quote from Edgar, Edgar Varese in 1916, which says, we need new instruments very badly. And he became uh, very excited about the theremin, which he thought was you know, a really great uh, new way to express ourselves. Uh, although old instruments are good as, t as well. This is a 3,000-year-old playable musical seashell that uh, is part of a project that Stanford Karma and archaeology at Stanford are doing in Peru uh, at an acoustical uh, dig um, 15,000 feet in the Andes, far from the ocean. And uh, so, really, um, my goal is to sort of study the instruments we have in order to figure out what interactions we like, what do we like about the expressions, and how can we bring some of that to the computer-mediated space, or how can we bring computer mediation to some of those instruments. Um, this is my all of physical modeling that we know in one slide fairly much. Uh, I've worked on all of these. I hacked together early versions of these that ran in real time on the next machine, as Gary said. And prior to that, I was working on a Mac 2 in Smalltalk. And prior to that, I was working on a Lisp machine. But um, we were doing physical modeling. All of us who are progeny of Julia Smith were looking at the way to use these waveguide models for strings and winds and modify them for bars. And as Gary said, my dissertation was on the voice. Uh, we're hearing actually a, a whole crew of physical models there, a bowed string, a pluck string, and a singer. If you don't understand what she's saying, it's because she's singing in Greek. If you're Greek, you might still not understand what she's saying. But, um, and we also studied, as uh, Gary said, the particle models which aren't waveguides, they're really statistical models with resonance, and uh, the radiation patterns of instruments. And that picture of Dan Truman there is fairly important because that led to much of the genesis of what's become known as the laptop orchestra instrument. Um, I learned early on starting in physical modeling in 1985 when I first moved to uh, Stanford. Actually, I had done uh, pitch to MIDI conversion and some other things in my um, bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from University of Missouri, but I hadn't really got into uh, the physics of music until my senior year there when I did a project in drum synthesis. But um, what I learned was is that good parametric real-time synthesis, all of these models would run in real time when we got the next machine because it had a DSP chip, we could put the stuff on there and use the music kit to hook it together and play it in real time either from the keyboard which is not a very good interface or the mouse which is a terrible interface or MIDI which is an okay-ish interface or custom controllers. So I got started right about that time. Uh, there was a visitor on sabbatical to Karma, who was a Karma alum, a Stanford alum, named Dexter Morrill. And we started on this project to build an expressive trumpet controller for Wynton Marsalis. Uh, Dexter had gotten a National Endowment for the Arts grant based on some work he'd done with Stan Getz to build this uh, MIDI trumpet, if you will, but it was actually a trumpet intimately linked to a next machine. Um, and then I continued to build, wow, I have just completely wedged my computer. This is awesome. It was. No, that was a sound file. But it was. All right. Let's try this first. Hopefully we can at least Let's try this.
this first. Let's try this next. No, I don't want to set down my computer. Wow, that's amazing. Let's try any ideas on how to get out of PowerPoint without destroying what is the shortcut for force quit. Command Q. Apple. <laughs> ah. All right. Let's try that. Sweet. All right. Let's report that. Oh no, I'm not on. I'm not. I'm not on the network. Sorry, I'm on my own network. All right, be there in a moment. So Dexter and I built this trumpet, hooked to the next machine through the serial port and the DSP port. And um, it um, basically had lots of sensors on the trumpet. We got donations from all the major brass manufacturers. We got mouthpieces with Teflon rims, which we put EMG sensors in so we could actually sense the player's uh, lip tension. So we had a a hook into non-causal pitch detection because we knew from the limp the lip was tensing. We had sensors on the valves, so we knew roughly, you know, where in the har or which harmonic series we were dealing with, and so we could run a pretty good pitch detector um, on that. And we were off and running. I also instrumented a whole lot of other instruments. I put sensors on my trombone. Uh, he had triggers on the trumpet that he could use to fire events, capture loops, do the standard sort of stuff we, we all do. And uh, then I also, since I had worked on um, wind instrument models, flute, clarinet, things like that, I looked at building a controller that could sort of hook into all of those parameters. So again, this idea of look at the interactions we have and try to exploit those, exploit either the virtuosity of good existing players or the extensions that computer mediation could bring to that. Um, when I moved to Princeton in 1996, actually prior to moving to Princeton in 1996, um, Ben Knapp and um, Dick Duda at San Jose State University have gotten a National Science Foundation grant to teach human-computer interface technology, which is basically uh, sensors, uh, stuff you can hook people up to computers with to make them more expressive. It's the stuff we all have now, essentially, in our pocket. But at that time, accelerometers had just become available, force sensing resistors, all of those things that we like to hook up and make our instruments more expressive with. Uh, and so we were off and running teaching a course. And it was actually a video conferenced course with Stanford Karma, San Jose State University. I moved to Princeton that year, UC Davis with Mira Blattner, U, uh, UCSC with the Naval Postgraduate School, and the IBM Almaden Research Center. So we'd all get together and work with this stuff together. This, turned out to be a really pivotal course because a lot of my students that took this course uh, ended up being the ones that I work for now. And so Ajay Kapoor, Dan Truman, those people. Um, I also was consulting with Interval Research, which was Paul Allen, co-founder of Microsoft's think tank to try to invent the future and patent it while they were at it. And um, so I worked with Bob, Ad Bob Adams, Bill Ferplank, and a lot of people in the music group there building um, expressive musical instruments. They worked with Thomas Dolby, I worked with Laurie Anderson, and so we were looking at things we could do again to make uh, computer mediation of the music space. Bill for Plank offered a challenge at that time. He said, why isn't any interaction I have with a computer as gratifying as making an omelet? He says, I crack the egg, I put it in the bowl, I grab the whisk, I stir it, I observe the texture, I hear it, I feel it, I see the frothiness, I smell the butter in the pan, I put it in. He said all of that stuff is immensely gratifying. And so I set out to start making interfaces that were kind of based on um, instruments, objects, and the kitchen. And so uh, my first 
sort of expressive instrument based on the kitchen was this coffee mug, which I built in 1996 and still works today, which is remarkable to me. Um, that's, we can, few of us in the computer mediated space can say that, you know, unless it's an iPhone and then it still probably doesn't work because we haven't upgraded to iOS 6 point whatever. But uh, this still works because it just puts out MIDI. And so uh, I built this coffee mug, which uh, basically talks, originally it was designed around these shaker instruments, as Gary said, um, to really offer up the same interface as we would for, oops, that was dumb. There we go. You hear that? Are you hearing anything? Are you hearing anything? Do you have any audio from there? One more time. I said it works. I swear to God. It really does. You have nothing? Stand by. There we go. No? Let's try another one. So it speaks MIDI. There we go. So it was designed for a shaker. So there's ice cubes in this glass. You shake it and you sound the, you hear the wonderful sounds, which we didn't hear. It also just speaks regular MIDI. And so I made it into a musical instrument inspired by the Cook Marl trumpet. Or a whole band. So, I showed this to my um, first HCI class, and uh, Ajay Kapoor was in that class, as was uh, Dan Truman, and as I said, a number of other people who would be influential in my life, and um, we were off and running, running. I also made a number of others, including the Philip Glass. Dan, God damn it, Dan started that year on his dissertation work, which was uh, looking at his experience as a fiddler and a uh, Hardinger folk fiddler and uh, traditional acoustic violin player and electric violin player. And he ended up working on a lot of things. One, hanging a whole lot of sensors on his uh, bow. So we built a bow that had many, many degrees of freedom measured. And then he also looked into this idea of um, building an instrument that was completely virtual, computer synthesized, but um, inspired by the interactions of a violin or a cello. And so this is the Bassa, the Bode Sensor Speaker Array. We hear him playing a piece from his dissertation work uh, called The Lobster Quadrille, in which each string is basically a stanza of a poem through a tuned comb filter, which you can control the resonance of and scrub forward and backward through this poem. Um, and you notice the speaker as well. That uh, came from his frustration coming to me and saying, as an electric violin player, I really hate playing through a guitar amp. Um, he said, it's either gonna sound okay for you but not for me, so okay, I can get two guitar amps or I can get a guitar amp and a monitor, but I like to play chamber music 
and uh, maybe where there's an acoustic guitar player with a slight amount of amplification and maybe a flute player and I'm playing electric fiddle. So now we need a monitor for each of them. He said, why can't I just have an object next to me that radiates sound, possibly omnidirectionally or possibly in a controllable way where what I hear is subtly different from what they're hearing but we can actually program that. And so we were off and running building spherical speakers after that as well. Uh, Curtis Bond got the bug and he started building many spherical speakers. This is Bubba, which takes two people to pick up. He's a bass player, so you can't just have a little spherical speaker like Dan had for his fiddle. You have to have a big thing that needs a stand. Um, this is Michael Tilson Thomas conducting an orchestra with Steve Mackey playing a guitar concerto through two spherical speakers. One a little louder right next to him one a little softer and delayed away from him. And so the orchestra gets the sense that the electric guitar player is amongst them as well. Uh, so Dan had a name for this. He called it electronic chamber music, which is the idea that we have computer mediation, we have electronic, we have amplification, but we really try to keep that intimacy of a chamber ensemble. So Interface was a band founded around that. That was primarily Dan and Curtis with friends, me, uh, Curtis Bond, Luke Dubois on video, uh, Nick Fortunato, and others would join in. Also from that class, Ajay Kapoor did his senior thesis uh, on the electronic tabla, which was basically putting sensors all over the shells of tablas or tablas, and coming up with means to measure the specific strokes, and uh, one, teach tabla playing, two, um, wire it differently. So take the gestures of a tabla player and do interesting things with it. And he's still at that today. That resulted in a concert which happened next door and at Princeton for NIME 2003 called the Gigapop Ritual, which was basically Dan Truman, Manjul Burgava on tabla, Tehong Park on bass in Princeton in the display wall room. Um, networked via Internet 2 and CA2Net to Montreal with Ajay on e sitar, me on Digital Do playing drones, Go Wong on software and Digital Spoon and Phil Davidson on graphics and we played this piece which starts off as sort of a usual ramping up and then eventually rhythmic. This is an air check directly from the console next door. The round trip delay was 60 milliseconds, so it's pretty much like being on a stage where a player is 30 feet away, if you think about it. And so it wasn't that bad. And then it eventually degenerates into more electronic sounds. Oops. Stop it. And ends up only with us playing the sensors and no acoustic sound whatsoever. And so we're sending uncompressed video, uh, essentially MIDI and audio bidirectionally from Princeton to Montreal. Uh, about the same time, another student who took my HCI class, Colby Leiter, who's now at the University of Miami, uh, he and I had been con uh, collecting uh, distressed accordions from eBay, basically, where they said, you know, the reeds are falling off, you can have it for $50 or shipping or something like that. And so uh, we bought up accordions. As a voice modeler and as a singer, I was always interested in, as I said, some better interface than a mouse or a MIDI keyboard or something like that to control the lots of degrees of freedom that you need in order to make compelling singing. And so we arrived at this idea of breathing, pitch, and articulation, and possibly some other sensors as well. This is Lisa, mine, this is Colby's Bart, and this is Maggie, and he made Santa's, Santa's Little Helper, which was a tiny toy accordion, and we continued from there, but here is uh, Lisa. The bellows vent switch produces 
creepy breathing sounds. That's my thesis singer, and I'm actually controlling the articulators of the acoustic tube. Overtone singing by hitting one of the register switches, I lock the fundamental and then the keyboard controls overtones. So I continued on with more voice controllers. Lisa was too big to carry, uh, you know, people who play accordion know that, and uh, so I wanted something a little bit more portable. Maggie was pretty good, but she didn't really have a keyboard, so I had to use brass valve fingering in order to get accurate pitch. Um, so I came up with the cow, which actually is kind of a bagpipe chanter. It's got eight switches on it, so I can use kind of BAME recorder fingering to get pitch, and an FSR. And then I came up with the voice-oriented melodica interface device, or the VOMID, which is basically a Korg microcontroller with a bunch of FSRs and tilt sensors and a breath pressure sensor. So you blow into it to control um, breath. And the cow, actually, you could blow into, but I got tired of blowing. My jaws got tired. And so I put a beach ball inside of a stuffed animal and stuck the hose in there, and then it made it into basically a bagpipe and so you control breathing that way. That was a trick I got from Interval. We had a football with a hose coming out of it that controlled a VL1, which we dubbed the porcophone, and it was really gratifying. To, it's gratifying to squeeze something and feel the effort. You know, there's something so fundamental about breathing and a, a object with air in it that you can squeeze. Um, meanwhile, in DSP land, I inherited a class from Paul Lansky and Ken Stieglitz at um, Princeton when I moved there based on a National Science Foundation grant for teaching DSP to artists and music and history of electroacoustic music and applied DSP to electrical engineering majors. And so I also got an NSF career grant to extend that curriculum and actually bring the physical modeling world into that. And that resulted in, uh, actually in 1995, I had started with the Synthesis Toolkit, which was sort of to take all these models that I knew anything about, which were written in various languages, languages from Lisp to Assembler to Smalltalk to Next Music Kit to all of that and port everything to C++ and give it away so that everyone would quit sending me emails saying, how does the flute model work? I tried to code up the block diagram, and when I put a square wave into it, it doesn't sound right. And I would say, well, you don't put a square wave into a flute. You blow into it. And so giving them running code um, was, um, it didn't decrease the amount of email traffic, but, uh, but it did help, at least. I could say, here's what you do. Hook it up, run it. And so uh, soon thereafter, Gary, uh, started helping maintain it and then kind of took it over actually and uh, it's still running today. It's been ported, it's embedded in iPhone apps, it's in, it, it, people use the classes from it to do all sorts of things. Out of that came a book, uh, Real Sound Synthesis for Interactive Applications, which basically steps you through DSP from the standpoint of physics. So we start with a mass spring damper and show how that's an oscillator and show how you can model that with a digital filter and we start with delays in a room and we show how hooking those delays together can make a reverberator and it just grows from there. And SDK is basically the included running code that comes with that book. So about the time Dan had gone off to um, Columbia for a year after he got his PhD and then he went off to Colgate for a year which is to take Dexter's old job when he retired and then we poached him back to Princeton as a faculty member. And he had posed an idea at the end of his thesis, which said, what would it be like to do electronic chamber music, but not? What would it be like to do electronic orchestral music? 
to actually fill a stage with people with computer-mediated instruments. And what would the challenges be? You know, the first challenge is you can make more noise than you want to hear with just one laptop. So it's not necessarily a good idea to have 15 or 40 of them. But um, out of that idea, um, Plork was born, the Princeton Laptop Orchestra, in 2005. And so um, there were others, of course, prior to that. The, Mimeo, Top Lap Organization, which is about live coding, things like that. Moscow Laptop Orchestra, Tokyo Laptop Orchestra. Those two are actually one or two people with a laptop who call themselves an orchestra because they make big sound. But basically, they're the typical laptop, you know, smoking and speakers, house sound, that sort of thing. Um, the Digital Music Ensemble, the Behavior Laptop Orchestra, the Mobile Performance Group. Uh, our, our grand lork is the hub, the Le League of Automatic Composers in 1977, uh, with where those guys hooked together computers in a network and exchanged musical and sonic material live in front of a highly confused audience, usually. Um, Plork's idea was to outfit Originally, Dan had posed five, but Maria Clawe, our dean of engineering, said, no, five's not enough. You need 15. I'll give you more money. So we said, okay, let's do that. So we built 15 identical speakers, which were built by Stefan Moore, who was uh, Curtis Bond's lab director, uh, sound di tech director at uh, RPI. 15 laptops. Pillows, we sit on pillows with the speaker right next to us, controllers and sensors, and thanks to a MacArthur Digital Learning Grant, all of this got blown out to 45 identical speakers, 45 laptops, potential for 45 people. The main tenet of Plork has been, two, two ten, three tenets, one tenet, um, each person is responsible for the sound coming from their speaker. There is no house sound. There might be a shared subwoofer, but basically it's orchestral in the sense that each person, when they do a gesture on their computer, they get to know that you know there isn't any of that. Is that you or me? Uh, who's, who's causing that? What is that? There's a volume knob on the top of every speaker, so you can lean over, and if you can't tell, you can turn it off, and you can tell immediately. It's an analog volume knob for the amps that are built inside. And one of the other tenants is no video. We've had guest artists do video, but basically we said, you know, orchestras don't feel the need to put a bunch of stuff going on on the screen to give the audience something to do and distract them from the fact that, you know, they may not be able to figure out what's going on. So we really decided early on to not do video unless we're displaying what we're doing. So there have been game pieces where you can actually see multiplayer things happening. Uh, there have been pieces that visualize the network as it's unfolding between the players. Um, our first piece was actually a vocal piece, interestingly. Uh, Dan and Gu hacked together some code that when the students pushed the A key, they were supposed to say A into a microphone. And um, so on and so forth, B, C, D. And when they came back to class, they were each supposed to do this five times till they were happy with the sound. So they'd say A, hit the A key, A, and it would play it back, and they'd say, oh, I don't like that, I'll do it again. They captured five of every letter and brought it back to class, and Dan had put together a different program, which took those and put them through tuned comb filters. And as they typed the alphabet in order, it would play back that sound file. It's not a very robust means of conducting, because if you get off by one or type the wrong letter, you've screwed up the whole piece. But uh, miraculously, it worked the first time. This is actually a freshman seminar. The students doing this are the first ever Plork students, and it was in their second semester at Princeton. First letter of the words. Soon after, 
We were off and running. You know, years ago, if you mentioned electronic music, people thought of weird machines with twisted wires and antennas. <laughs> kind of like ding, 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 ding. <laughs> Today we live in a world filled with synthesized sound, and now a new musical group has taken the whole idea one step, or should we say one lap, further. Here's Fox 29's Gerald Copan. <laughs> Unlike the usual ensemble, this one doesn't tune up. They set their speakers in place, plug up their cables, and make sure they're sufficiently wired. Then conductor Go Wong leads them off, and they launch into music that sounds like a combination of bubblegum pops and signals from Sputnik, all in a day's work for the Princeton Laptop Orchestra. Historically, musical instruments have been at the edge of technology. This was the, uh, that was the second year. We had already turned it into a junior, senior level course, which students applied for. It was a four credit course, which at Princeton is a big deal, because the orchestra and the choir are not four credit. They are ensembles which students elect to participate in. And so having it actually uh, be a four credit course, we could require them to do stuff like, you know, take their laptop home and work on things and come back to class ready to play and other things. So it's an experiment in highly parallel processing. Um, the big question was how do we distribute the responsibility and uh, hold the interest? So what makes it interesting for the player, you could, you could have the conductor send signals to all of the laptops which the students have just set up and the conductor could push space and it would just play a piece which wouldn't be that interesting. You could have it just be a free form go design your own weird computer music instrument and come back and we'll all sit down and jam which is not a good idea with 15 or 20 people. So uh, each piece was an experiment in what's the role of the network, do we conduct visually like Go was doing when he does clicks that you're hearing right now. So this means type letters that are low in the alphabet, type letters that are high on the alphabet, and there's a translation from the ASCII code to the resonance of a uh, center frequency of a resonant filter. Um, and he conducts the players. So that means you people do this, and you people don't, and everyone do it. And so it's a very nice spatial visual thing. That's one model. We, each piece is essentially different. Um, it was really scary. We didn't know if the network would be that usable using wireless for synchronization like that, especially in a university environment where there's lots of wireless traffic, things like that. Uh, so we invited a lot of people to help. Paul, who was local, Brad, who was roughly local, Curtis Bond, who was part of the Interface crew and an alumnus of Princeton, Scott and Guh. Scott was the music TA, and Guh was the computer science engineering TA for this course. And so um, they were amazing and built speakers, hooked things up, fixed things, wrote code. Lots of guest performers in those first couple of years Zakir, Pauline, so percussion had a big concert, went on tour to Dartmouth, uh, where we discovered that uh, having all the dorms outfitted with wireless is not a good idea to have a concert right after dinner. Um, because everybody goes back to their dorm room and starts doing whatever they do, and our wireless was hosed. So we ended up doing a lot of asynchronous pieces where we sync wild by hitting the space bar, and we don't rely on the network for doing anything. We did a grad seminar and it grew and grew. Uh, the teaching topics, we actually taught uh, programming, we teach some HCI. Uh, there were basically no requirements for the course, but we ended up with a Plork 1 and a Plork 2. Plork 1 was learning programming, learning uh, the compositional things, uh, critical listening, field recording, things like that. And then students who took that course could then come back the next year and take advanced plork. And then we had students who did their senior thesis a year after that. So we had kind of some students who majored in plork in a strange way. Um, lots of things available to teach. All of this ended up being powered by Chuck, which was Guz's uh, dissertation work, but was invented prior to that. 
Chuck is this language that um, makes it really easy to quickly try things out with audio. It's uh, text-based, so you, you type or you copy and paste from other code that you know that works. It's not graphical. It was kind of designed to be the anti-Max, anti-PD. Um, and um, it subsumes SDK, so it already has all the physical models built in and lots of other unit generators as well. It is a wonderful real-time interactive, on-the-fly interpreted, plus pre-compiled, strongly typed, strongly timed, so you can execute things at the sample level, at the subsample level, and decide what your uh, service rate is for MIDI or OSC or video or joystick. You can basically have a, a shred, which is like a thread, uh, which you spork as opposed to forking. Um, watching the joystick and it can wake up randomly or it can wake up every hundred milliseconds and so you can really decide there's no notion of an, of a, an interaction rate and an audio rate and so and that can change dynamically. It's a lot like C but not really. It's, it steals heavily from Java. It subsumes SDK and RT audio. It has devices built in. The accelerometers in the laptop, the, uh, anything you can plug into USB that's visible as a human interface device is there. MIDI, OSC, network, file I.O., serial, things like that are now built in. Um, depending on time, I will show you just a really quick honko chuck. So here's some Chuck. I'll just make a new file. Make our font bigger. Unit generators are built in. Um, lots of things. So here's a Synosc called ESC. Chuck to the DAC. Syn uh, syntax highlighting tells you if you're getting things roughly right. The Chuck symbol is a highly overloaded operator that performs many things. One, we're using it to patch unit generators together. Two, we're using it to advance time by chucking a value to the reserved word now. What that basically does is schedule, schedules this shred to go to sleep while audio runs for one second, and then it wakes up and sees if there, anything else should happen. Oops, no. So that's assignment, so I'm assigning it to the frequency uh, variable of my Synosc. Uh, let's do this, 1.0 second. So you can live code in it, maybe. Let me start the virtual machine. There we go. So that ran, and then it returned and did nothing. Uh, there's a whole bunch of our third assignment, essentially, in uh, Plork, which has become our fourth assignment, I think, in the new curriculum that we're doing at CalArts, Programming for Digital Artists, is a drum machine. And so we give them the basic mechanisms and sound files and things like that. And through um, controlling these individual hunks of code, which you can add to the virtual machine while it's still running, we can so that's a drum, that's a kick drum. Uh, we do modulo arithmetic on time. So time is a native data type in Chuck, as is duration. And so these shreds, or these pieces of code, know nothing about each other. But they're synchronized because of that modulo arithmetic on time. Encourages live coding. Here's another one in Octave Up. I'll just add it. Another Octave Up. If I don't like that, I can uh, replace it on the fly. So there's one in a 
whole step down. Here's another one a whole step above our basic tonic. Any one of these I can pull out if I remember what they are. And the virtual machine is still running. So you can edit code and pop it back in. And so for doing assignments, for teaching synthesis, for live coding, or for writing Chuck pieces, this was really what powered uh, very much. Although our guest artists, uh, Paul Lansky did a piece in Super Collider, Brad Garten did a uh, piece, of course, in RTC Mix. Um, you know, each person, Luke, did a piece in Max with video. So each person brought their own thing, but uh, most of us worked in Chuck. Um, Chuck Plork, Guh, graduates finally, gets a job at um, Stanford. A laptop orchestra. Instead of instruments, the musicians play computers. And their first public concert, and only the second one anywhere, took place this weekend. Richard Hart was there to answer the question, how do you conduct computers? We have here 20 stations, each of which is a laptop and a speaker array. Each speaker array is six channels of sound. You put that together, that's 120 channels of sound, and that's spread out, in fact, here all over the garden. If you just walk 10 feet from you, you're in a totally different sonic space. Co-founder of Apple, Steve Wozniak, came to this show with some of his friends, all on segways, which added to the surreal nature of Silicon Valley laptop orchestra concert outdoors at Stanford. You know, the harder I do it, and then you can also change the key. With all the controls, it makes sense. So, um... Plork, Slork, Begat, many other in the very same model pretty much. Uh, the Oslo Laptop Orchestra, Boulder bought our old speakers when we built our new ones on the MacArthur Grant. Uh, the Mobile Phone Orchestra called MoFo at Stanford. Um, Michigan, Kalamazoo bought some of our other speakers. Um, Let's see, Louisiana Orchestra, Laptop Orchestra of Louisiana, LOL, uh, Virginia, which is a Linux laptop orchestra, Arizona State, or LORCAS, as it's called, um, and many others have come around. Um, based on our MacArthur grant, Dan's connections, being a good composer, and lots of other things, we ended up doing some very, very big shows in 2010. One Carnegie Hall with the American Composers Orchestra as a Concerto Grosso, large orchestra, small eight-person laptop orchestra, small orchestra. Um, the sound you're hearing is us with So Percussion and Matmos doing Supreme Balloon live, essentially orchestra, taking a, a studio-produced piece and orchestrating it for all the players. So each one's playing the individual instruments. That was the largest, I think, that we've ever fielded. It was about 42 people on stage, um, all responsible for their sound. Percussionists, laptop orchestra, and two guest laptoppers. Um, meanwhile, Ajay Kapoor is off doing his own thing. He goes off to Victoria to study with my uh, graduate student, um, George Sanitakis, machine learning carrying his e tabla and e sitar in tow and uh, working with Andy Schloss and George um, started building musical robots. The idea that you should be able to mach use machine learning and uh, sensors and networks in order to make little things you can play with. And so the Mahadevi bot was born, which is this contraption, and many since then. So this is Glockenbot, uh, this is uh, Ganesh, this is uh, Tammy, which is a marimba. He uh, hooked up at CalArts, where he is now Associate Dean of Digital Arts Research and uh, Music Faculty, 
um, with Michael Darling, who's a theater uh, stage crafter and a theater director, um, technical director, and uh, who likes build fabricating stuff. So they started building beautiful sculptures that basically gave the robots a very interesting visual appeal. You'll see more and more as we go along. Out of that, the machine orchestra was built. So uh, performers, controllers, monomes, they have a big monome culture there, uh, weird things they build as class projects, hooked to a server and the robots and local sound. So very often each player will have a little spherical speaker next to them making some sound, possibly just monitoring, um, and lots of robots. Big productions, uh, Red Cat Theater, at, um, in downtown LA, have done two or three fairly large shows there with dancers, gamelan orchestras, gamelan robot orchestras. Um, this was our spring showcase last, um, last spring. And students doing their final projects, Ajay playing the sitar. That's kind of what Cal Arts is like in May, by the way. If you, if you go down there, you'll see. It's, uh, it's really quite, quite frightening. Come on, wake up. Um, this year, um, not a machine orchestra concert, but a series of concerts and a day-long expo, with, which pretty much took over most of Cal Arts with all of the digital projects, the students doing videos, animators, all of this sort of stuff, all produced by Ajay and his group. Um, this was a piece I did based on some portable robots that I built. Uh, Ajay's proud of being able to take his robots apart and put them in suitcases for shipping, but I actually built robots that are suitcases. So they're completely self-contained, they're wireless, they're battery powered, and they communicate to each other and laptops via a few different protocols, including infrared flashes, just for pulse, and um, wireless MIDI, and eventually 802.11, once it's talking to the so this is Walter, who's on the floor here, flashing. And this is his uh, sister, Valise. He's just a step sequencer. There's some thumpers inside the box and some switches to control the groove. And Valise is uh, more programmatic. And then I actually break out some instruments, such as a shaker and a cowbell, and hand them to audience members. Now it's talking to the network. My laptop is getting pulses. There's a cowbell. I'm going to hand off to an audience member. Then these two other guys join in who are normal machine orchestra members doing drums and bass and beats. And the whole piece ends. controlled by a wireless remote. <laughs> Onward. So, as a singer, once we got plork rolling, machine orchestra, I really started thinking back to my roots and this idea of singing synthesis, controllers for vocal models, and also just process sound. I'm a big fan of Laurie Anderson, who I did a graduate seminar with my last year at Princeton and people who use effects on their voice as their main means of expression. And so uh, I started thinking more and more about, you know, what might choirs look like, this same idea. You know, fine, we can see one singer with some looping pedals and a drum cat like uh, Amy Newberg or Pamela Z or Laurie Anderson doing a solo act, but what might an ensemble look like? And uh, how, again, the same questions. How do we part that out and make it make sense? 
and not have it just be uh, crazy. So um, worked on a bunch of pieces starting in 2010 and some of them ensemble pieces. And so this is a piece I actually did that's a solo piece uh, at CalArts for the last year's spring show. This is called Haberman. I'm basically controlling, capturing my voice. Stop it. I'm using these golf tethers, the Game Track Pro, which are these great three, two, three degree of freedom, almost invisible threads that come out of this thing that sits on the ground. It's designed to hook to these gloves and measure your golf swing for a game, but we just co-opted them for Plork and ended up buying almost a hundred of them. We hang them from the ceiling, pull down on them and things like that, and they just show up as two joysticks, two hid devices. Standard looping piece, but I'm just controlling it without touching anything, essentially. And that piece actually ends with me controlling a vocal model using the video camera. Just doing optical flow and flux in different regions to control a very simple vocal model. did a piece for Plork last year called Lork Saterna, which is actually an ensemble piece. The singers have no microphones. We're using the mic that's built into the laptop. They capture their voice and then process it. The sound's coming from their speaker, which they're standing in front of. When they lean forward, it releases that loop and sets up the mic to capture the next sound. They're actually seeing a score with a little bubble that floats corresponding to their tilt and it says, go to this region. That was a little piece of machine learning waiting for a consonant of a particular kind, lorks, to switch to the next section. Uh, I worked with Ben Knapp on a bunch of biosensors and things like that for instrumenting speakers. He's worked on a music stand with EMG sensors, so when you grab it, it can measure your various levels of stress. I'm interested in uh, the speakers, as always, so these are little singer speakers that sit right in front of the stand and a subwoofer on the floor. So again, the sound comes from you. Uh, and that, these can work in fairly large spaces. You know, they're anemic compared to large house sound, but uh, so is a singer, you know, unless they're an opera singer and then they're doing special things their whole life so that they can be heard over an orchestra. Um, for this year's show, I um, integrated some of these ideas together into a completely wireless device. This is the Foios, which is a singer's folder wire folder. It's got a uh, wireless mic transmitter, a wireless headphone receiver, but it doesn't drive headphones. It actually drives these little um, speakers built into the folder. And so uh, I did this piece from the audience, essentially. So that takes care of the issue of this sounding really wimpy from there. But I did it from the audience, but the wireless mic goes to my computer and back. And so capturing sound for this, um, I'll just show you the interface for it. Stop it. There we go. So I've got a little uh, iPad Touch here running Touch OSC. If everything works right, it will connect. This 3D printed 
is for my iPhone so I can shoot video of me while I'm singing. So I get an extra point of view camera. Um, the piece I did down there for the show was actually a uh, three camera shoot. And so I haven't put that together yet, but um, go, go. there we go. So I'm controlling that. This would, if my wireless mic were working, capture what I'm saying right now. buttons on here and some samples or things I've captured. So this is generation zero pre-alpha, um, which was good enough to do a show and amaze the voice department at CalArts. So they've asked me to come back next fall to co-convene a vocalist effects sort of seminar with Andrea Young, who's getting her PhD there, and or DMA. And, um, but, so now I'm working actually on integrating this. I wanna basically try to get, you know, everything onto one board or two and have it not, as you can see, you know, the amount of space left over for music <laughs> was quite small, but that's okay. You know, that was enough, enough to do a piece and this folder is this piece right now. But I'm um, looking at integrating more of that, putting more sensors in it, Ben's EMG idea, possibly blood gas, so we can know, you know how oxygen starved the singer is at particular passages and things like that. And um, so another topic, which I'll kind of finish up with here, is um, perhaps choirs of the future will be more crowdsourced since everything is social and everything is online and everything is Facebooky and everything is Twittery and all that sort of stuff. So uh, there have been a few projects recently, Bicycle Built for 2000, where they shipped out to Amazon Mechanical Turk. Uh, each subject was basically asked to make a sound like this. Eh. And so you go, eh, and that's it. And they put all that together and it sings Daisy in a giant choir. So they're basically taking the pieces of an arrangement and, and shipping it out into little pieces that a crowd can do. Uh, Eric Whitaker did a couple of pieces based on send me a YouTube video of you singing this music and he put together a choir. Uh, Sabrina Pena Young is working on an opera which will come out in October which is basically an animated anime uh, mechanica mechan machinima uh, opera. Um, she put out casting calls via Facebook and auditions by recording, and put all the backing tracks and click tracks and scores on Bandcamp, and uh, we all submitted our stuff. I'm playing, I'm co-playing one of the, the male leads in this. I've never met her. I've never met any of the cast before. Um, and it'll screen in about 100 locations in 2013. It's gonna premiere in Florida and then in New York right after that. But um, anyway, she has three sopranos playing uh, the, the female lead of Libertaria. Um, okay, so crowdsourced choirs. Um, as I said, everything's virtual now. If you look at the chain of Plork plus Chuck leading to Slork, leading to the Mobile Foreign Orchestra and eventually leading to Smule, which is originally was called Sonic Mule, um, here's a lot of the apps we've come out with over the last uh, four years. We're now at 75 employees and uh, I don't know how many downloads. We've had, last November we crossed one billion musical performances that had been done in our apps at some point. Uh, what you were hearing was T-Pain. Our first kind of crowd app was Glee, where you could sing along with the cast. Um, and other people. People started forming their own ad hoc glee clubs and gangs. They actually call themselves gangs. Here's a, so here's a bunch of people singing Living together. In a this was actually our pitch for Fox she and the Glee production company. We took T-Pain, took all the art out, stuck glee art in, recorded this, and Just showed them see. basically what it would sound like. But what we have is people getting together this is a grandfather and his granddaughter located in here and here singing together. This is an ensemble who'd never met putting together a 
They're not even using our music. They're not buying any songs from us. They're just using it as a weird multi-track recorder. Bring me a dream. One's in Australia. One's in Europe. Two are in the U.S. And uh, after the tsunami, a group got together, and this group is now topped at 5,000. So um, we see more and more of this, and actually our app Sing, we're doing more and more to make it easier to, I can issue a call for my friends on Facebook or my friends in Sing to join me in a duet or to join me in a quartet or to join me in an open call, and I can curate that and control that. And um, until today, at in 13 minutes, We've never had a cross-app ability to play music and sing together. Uh, we talked about it with Magic Piano, we talked about it with Ocarina, but at 11 o'clock uh, it will be officially announced, it's already in the App Store, I checked it before my talk, uh, guitar exclamation mark, and guitar will actually, when you drop in and download guitar, you say I want to play a song, you'll be accompanying someone from Sing who's one of our curated by the users highest rated singers. And so you basically get to accompany uh, somebody who nailed some song and you're playing guitar. They, they sang it possibly with the studio accompaniment, but then you get to play along with that. All the apps are free, we basically sell you songs. Um, and now with guitar we'll probably sell you amps and microphones and classic guitars and effects and pedals and things like that. Um, based on all of this, as, as is the sickness of many academics, we, we write books about it too as we go along. I've been working on this book since I got a Guggenheim in 2003. I swore its 10th anniversary was going to be the finishing year, but you'll see why I probably won't finish this book this year in a minute. Um, this is a lot of technology uh, history of the voice, uh, opera, concert halls, theaters, surgery, castrati's, you know, pretty much anything you can think of as being technology and pretty much anything you can think of as being expressive voice. So actors, preachers, prayers, singers. Um, and that's all located there. That's coming. I swear it is. But that got a little bit preempted by Ajay, um, who I work with a lot at CalArts now. And so we got an NSF grant a year ago called a CS Curriculum for Digital Arts Majors in order to basically create, we've already been teaching Chuck and processing to the arts majors in music technology, but now it's branched out now to a digital arts minor, which many people from the school are taking. So he's got 80 in his Chuck class this year, and it could become 200 by next year based on the digital arts minor. Based on that, uh, we got together with uh, Gu and Spencer, who was one of the architects, early architects of Chuck. He was the first programmer at, non-Gu programmer at Smule, who's now Gu's grad student. And uh, we're writing a book, basically, that's the Chuck book. And Chuck with other things. We show you how, how to hook Chuck to Ableton Live and Max and processing and all that stuff in later sections. And, um, Based on that, all of this sort of happened. It was a perfect storm of craziness in the spring. And CalArts uh, cut a deal with Coursera to offer three courses. And so we will be offering uh, Chuck 101 on Coursera. It'll start at the end of September. And we have 15,000 enrolled already. And we, we think that could top out at 50 because Will I Am said he was taking the course and he tweeted it to his followers. And so, you know, we may have many. Black Eyed Peas fans trying to learn to program in Chuck, which is surreal. I mean, we will, we will, we will increase the number of Chuck programmers in the world. Even if only 5% of the people who enroll finish, we will increase the number of Chuck programmers by 100-fold, I think. And so that will be interesting. Um, I want to thank a lot of people, NSF. Lots of funding from Princeton through the years. This is my personal arc of the laptop orchestra. You know, how, what, what funded a lot of this stuff as we went along. Um, and 
lots of thanks to all these people that I collaborated with, most of whom I tried to cite as we went through. Um, so basically, that's, that's my view of the Laptop Orchestra arc, as I said, and uh, it's, it's still going. You know, if you look at uh, the kinds of things that um, we're doing at CalArts, and you know, one of the exercises is a networked drum machine, where you know, each student is supposed to go off and do something, and they're supposed to come back to class ready to play, and so they connect to the network and go. Uh, the machine lab at CalArts is constantly on. You go into the machine lab and the robots are actually suspended from aircraft cabling and they're on and they're connected to the server. So you can basically walk into the machine lab and send OSC from any device and cause the robot, if it's alive and hasn't burst into flames or been unplugged or rebooted by somebody, um, you can start playing that robot. And so uh, it's, it's sort of a space that encourages that idea of, of connected music making with objects that aren't you, you know, and, um, and the idea of extending yourself, um, as I'm doing with the singer and the singers. So anyway, uh, I think I'll stop there and uh, we can think about lunch or the next set of talks, that's right. I have no idea what time it is. It's three hours earlier on the East Coast, so or on the West Coast. Thank you very much.